Amen. Amen. Do you have your Bibles tonight? Let's look at e- Bibles, iPads, iPhones, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5. I want to begin there, and I believe we'll look at a number of things tonight, just as the Lord um, uh, has impressed upon my heart to share with you tonight. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. I want to make this point. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Then look at, uh, let's look at Proverbs 29. I read that just out of the New King James. And then Proverbs, the 29th chapter, verse 18. I want to just set these scriptures as a foundation for uh, what the Lord would have me share tonight. I'll read also this out of the New King James. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. Same concept there. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. And then I also want to read out of the Passion because I love how he's, he's looked at that verse. Where there is no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss fills your soul. Where there is no clear prophetic vision, people quickly wander astray. But when you follow the revelation of the word, heaven's bliss fills your soul. Now, here's the first point I believe the Lord would have us make tonight that I think will be important to us, and is this. First point is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God, or therefore, some translations, uh, therefore, be imitators of Jesus. So here's the first point, and it's this. The vision of God for every believer. How many are in Christ tonight? Amen. The vision of God for every believer is not to get you to heaven. <laughs> the vision of God for every believer is not to get you to heaven. And this is not a small thing. That's part of the reason why I read Proverbs 29, 18. Because it, 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 it could seem minor to you. But it's not exactly minor because if your life vision is simply get to get to heaven, then your main focus will be on just getting there. But God's main focus for your life is for you to be like Jesus. God's main focus for your life. And here's the God is like beyond genius level, brilliant, amazing, like that's why he's God. It's like, that's why he gave you tongues, because it's difficult to describe him. But he likes who he made you. In fact, the Bible teaches us that he knew us before the very foundation of the world. That's a, yeah, that's a good thought. And since God has been around forever, right? He's, he, he is I am. <laughs> he, he's about as forever you, as you can be. He's been around forever. He thought about you before the foundation of the earth. So it's, it's possible that you've been in God's mind forever. And he saw you. He saw how he made you. He made you uniquely. He made you uniquely with unique handprints, with, 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 uh, with, with unique desires. He also made the world for man's enjoyment. I mean, why do you have all these, you know, like 20 different types of purple and all these different types of flowers and stuff? These things are of no benefit to God, but he thought they would be benefit to us, and they are. Here's another key point, life principle, when you look at the world. The enemy cannot create anything. It can only distort the original desire God had for something. Why do you think part of the, you know... We've just seen it really unleashed in America the last few years, this whole thing with transgressions, because it's, it's, it's a goal to destroy God's original intent for that, the beauty that God had for that. So God saw you. He made you unique. He made you like certain things. And the goal of God is not to get every believer to be the same. That's important. Because sometimes, and it's not bad in a sense, because when we're in a family, sometimes, even when I was growing up, it was like where I grew up, classic Pentecostals, like the young men who got on fire back then, they all wanted to be Jimmy Swagger. 
And it, it, he was a great preacher, but God doesn't want another Jimmy Swagger. He made Jimmy Swagger. That's right. And then got around the, you know, get around every movement got it. Get out of the faith people, you know. People everyone want to be Brother Copeland, you know. Then you get around the revival people, and everyone wanted to be like Bill Johnson. They'd have those pauses, but they weren't as anointed as him, so it really looked weird, you know. So <laughs> the goal of God. The goal of God is not for you to be like someone else. Amen. The goal of God is for you to receive the grace and the anointing that people have and then add it to your own unique walk. That's the purpose of the fivefold ministry. So the goal of God is to make you like Jesus, not to get you to heaven. Heaven is a consequence of being a follower of Jesus. Now, this is, this, is, uh, this is also a really important and, and interesting observation that I've had over the years that many people, they want to go to heaven, but they don't want to obey God here. There's a real problem with that one. Because in heaven, everyone's obeying him. And if all, you, all you're like, hey, I just, you know, just want to get there. If that's the goal of your life, you might not get there. So the goal is to be like him. And the goal is to be like him. And here's another point. This, I want to make this point. This is the greatest time to be alive. Amen. This is. I, I, not because I need something to say. I believe it with all my heart. And the Lord has told me, this generation has been given access to things that no other generation has been given. Over and over again, one of the words that I've heard over and over again in the last probably five or six years, the Lord will just say, this generation is being given unprecedented access to unprecedented revelation. Now, obviously, when we talk about revelation, we're not talking something that goes beyond the word of God, but it's insight and understanding, it's wisdom, it's the ability to, uh, a, a truly mature prophetic person is not someone who can give a word, it's someone who knows what the Lord wants to do and then discerns how to make it come to pass. Or call, let me, put, let me say it this way, cooperate with the Lord to birth it in the earth. Because most of the things that God asks you to do, you cannot do without him. You can't get saved without him. But it's amazing to me that people realize they can't get saved without him, but they try and live, do everything else without him, and then God challenges them to impossible. Well, I can't do that. The whole, that's the whole point. You can't do it without him. But he is asking for your agreement on the earth to learn his wisdom to cooperate it, to birth it. So it's the greatest time to be by, but let me also say this. The end goal of God, and I, I, I'm a person who learns by asking questions. And a number of weeks ago, I was with a certain leader, and I'm not disparaging him in any way, but I, I, I asked him, I've been with him, I have a relationship with him for many years. And so it was rolling around in me, so I asked him this question. I said, well, what's the, what's the vision? What's the vision for the group of people you live in, I think you've been at 12 years a certain place and really plowsing hard and working. And he said, well, the goal is a move of God. I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. I get that. That's, you know, he wants a move of God. I like moves of God. And we had a powerful move of God. That's in there. But I thought this. The goal can't simply be a move of God. The early church started in a move of God. The goal wasn't a move of God. The goal was a continuous abiding move of God where people replicated the works of Jesus and what we call revival is a normal thing so that the whole earth can be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. So the goal can't simply be a move of God. Think about this. Heaven on earth was God's goal when they were, when they were created in the garden. They were put in the garden. It was, I mean, it, you can't, there's not really adequate words to describe how beautiful it was and how beautiful they were created. Perfect in every way. World was perfect in every way. Lots of things to still discover, but it was perfect in every way. But that was just the beginning. So the beginning is just, the beginning is a move of God. But what are you going to do with the move of God? I want to suggest to you, it can't simply just be the idea that we come to church seven days a week and fill it. 
It's got to be the ability to, yes, I love the presence of God. Yes, I love the outpouring of God. And here's the other thing that I want to encourage you with, too. This is like a common like wisdom thing with leaders. I work a lot with leaders. Like, well, people don't want, brother, people don't want to come to service for, for three hours. No, they just don't want to come to your service for three hours. <laughs> because when God is somewhere, I mean, one of the aspects of, of uh, Sister Catherine Coleman's meeting was uh, she, and I went to the church in June when I was in Pittsburgh, I, and you could still feel the presence of the Lord there. She would, she, the meeting was supposed to start at seven, but people would show up by three o'clock and it would be filled by four. So she'd start the meeting at four and they say for five or six hours. Why? Because the glory of the Lord was there. It's, you know, honestly, I've observed this. It's, 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 it's not, I, I've invited my unsaved friends to meetings I've done and they've gone long and they've sat there the whole time long. It's usually believers who give you a hard time about how long it goes. You're right. You're right. So when people go, oh, they don't, they don't want to, no, they just want to sit in what you're doing for two hours. But they will be there because it's their heart's cry. But the goal of God can't simply be to, be, to, to have a move of God. The goal of God is to be, it, that, that's just what God calls normal. And that's part of our challenge is, uh, we have looked at certain things as like, this is it right here. This is the optimum. And most of those things are just simply invitations to normal. Every person in here, if you're a believer, you should be believing God to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. You should have a deep, deep fellowship with God. You should constantly be hearing the voice of God. You should put the word of God first place in your life. But, but these things should be settled issues for believers. Amen. The challenge is, is, Often, we, as believers, we're trying to get people to just simply do the fundamentals week after week. It's unfortunate there's people that still decide on a Sunday morning if they're going to come to a service. That's right. And so these things, this move of what the move of God shows us is what God says is normal. And I think there's just this invitation for us all of us in this room to recommit to God's original intention. And, to, and I think some people too, some people think that, I think there's this thought not always said, there's this thought of like, like I, and I think sometimes the reason sometimes people are praying for moves of God is because then, then it's just like they wave the magic wand and everything gets better. A real genuine move of God will be sacrificial. Yes. Might have to cause some of you to change jobs because you have to be here every night at 6.30. You might miss certain things. You might not be able to go to the beach because God's moving. But I'll tell you this. I think it gets quiet with that one. But there's nothing wrong with those things. It's just when... God begins to do certain things, everything else becomes less of a priority. I don't know about you, but uh, probably the more days I spend on earth, the very, I have very little tolerance for things that are not within the scope of my purpose. Why? Because I have a lit- limited amount of time. I have a limit. This is the shortest part of my existence, and I have a responsibility, and you and I have a responsibility Not to do religious things, but to live within our purpose and leave fruit that remains for generations to come. That's our responsibility. I live with this sobering thought every day. God doesn't judge you for what you're doing. He judges you for what he called you to do. I felt to start with that foundation and then to lead into this, there's a very simple word that I have not been able to uh, move past, and uh, it's this word that the Lord gave me on August the 12th, 2001, excuse me, 2021, and he just gave me this simple word, and he said, we are in a defining moment in the earth. 
we are in a defining moment in the earth. And I didn't even realize that there is actually a dictionary definition for the, the word defining moment, but it's this. A point at which the essential nature of a character of a person or group is revealed. Defining moment. A point at which the essential nature of a character of a person or group is revealed. And I thought, we are in a defining moment for God's people. Do you know it's possible, and we'll look at this scripturally here in a moment, it's possible for God to have set aside certain things for this generation, certain things for you and your family, certain things for this corporate group of people as a group of people. But if your heart is not positioned correctly, you might not fully receive everything that God has for you. And I believe that this is a season where the Lord is inviting us to be intentional to facilitate and practice the fundamentals. Part of the root of being a disciple is that root word of discipline. And an an undisciplined person can never fully inherit what God has for them. And so it's it's not a shame or a blame, but it's 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 this re-emphasizing on leaning into the strength of God and to be well in every area of life, spirit, soul, and body. Your three parts, just like God, is three distinct persons, one God. And if one of those parts are out of alignment, you will not be able to fully maximize what God has for you. You know, uh, it's not to be mean or anything to anyone. If you got this call, to, I mean, remember, just to give my own example from my own life, Certainly having a ride in this area, but many years ago, when I probably my first year or right before I started full time ministry, the Lord spoke to me. He said, "You will never be able to do what I have asked you to do unless you keep your body in order." And I've tried to do that the best I could. Five oh five, the alarm clock went off. Did a strength exercise, and now it's now it's a lot easier too. They got these apps; you can do it right at home. No excuses. I'm always moving my body. And I, I have much more clarity too. Sometimes, how do you, I make time to do it because I, I, my mind thinks better. With all the responsibility, my just mind is just tracking better. That and coffee. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> coffee is from the Lord. <laughs> but we're, we're in, it's possible for God to make something available to a generation, but unless you're positioned correctly, you might not receive everything God has for you. It's it's amazing to me, the New Testament equivalent to this is Jesus goes into his hometown, right? And it says, it didn't say that God didn't want to do mighty miracles. It didn't say that God didn't want to do something. He could not. He could not. Sometimes I like to, that's actually encouraging to me because if you love people, you have this passion to see them walk in fullness. But I've learned this, you can't want something more than somebody wants something. And one of the greatest lessons that the Lord taught me years ago is I'm nobody's Messiah. In spring of, uh, just kind of linking two prophetic words, and we'll look at something scripturally here. In the spring of 2020, uh, we were on this prayer call. In the middle, most, most of the world was, our, our country was surely shut down during that time, and we were praying six days a week. We're still gone. Thank you, Lord. Lord birthed something during that season. Uh, we were praying in the spring of 2020, and I was in my home office, and few minutes into the call, I look up and there's this angel I've never discerned in my whole life. And kind of how these things go, it's didn't really ask the Lord, I just thought it. And he's just like looking right through me, not looking at me, looking through me. And the fear of the Lord just comes into my home office. And you know how these things go, he's like in between my wall and my desk. I I don't know how he does that, but I guess he's a spirit being can do it. So I'm thinking, what is he looking at? And the Lord speaks to me. He says, he's watching to see if you and the body of Christ are going to respond correctly in this season. And then I saw him leave 
and I saw him go through the United States like fire, watching how the people of God would respond in a season. So we're in a defining moment for God's people. We're in a defining moment where we can, if we will position ourselves properly, receive what the Lord has for us. Look at um, our defining moment will be determined. Let me read that. Our defining moment will be determined by our positioning. You can, you can actually, I've, I, I've witnessed this many times. You can be in an environment, in a room, where God is giving you access to certain things, but if your heart is not positioned correctly, you will not fully receive what God has for you in that moment. I'm an observer of people, and I'm an asker of questions. I remember, uh, I've been in meetings, and I'm thinking like, that was amazing. Like, that was like, I needed to hear that. That spoke to me. You know, then maybe you're out at dinner or something, and someone goes, oh, they, that's the sixth time I've heard him preach that. I'm thinking, well, apparently you didn't get it the first six times, so God had to sit at you again. They preach the same thing every time they come to my city. They, all this stuff. And, and I, I just, suppose I don't care if I've heard him preach it 30 times. Apparently, I needed to hear it the 31st time if I'm in the room. And so a lot of times, it's the positioning of your heart, or God is, you know, I, I've seen it many times in a room, and word of knowledge is given specifically for that person's condition. And they say, Why don't you, if you'd like to receive prayer for that, come on up, and they'll just sit there. If God wants me to get it, let's just get it right back here. <laughs> well, God's moving up there, and he said, go up there. What a lot of people don't realize is it's actually God speaking through that person. If a little boy takes a mic, a little girl takes a microphone, and they feel like they say I have something from the Lord, I'm listening. Because I can't miss a moment without honoring what God is saying. And I've learned that if you treat those moments as casual, you could fully miss the nutrients of what God wants to give you in that moment. Be very wary of becoming even casual when you come into God's house. Every person here, take, you know, you have a responsibility and you go in. When you come in to a room like this, especially if you're a leader here, you should be going... We're going to hear a word from the Lord today. God's going to do miracles today. We're believing God for salvation. Why? You're adding. Don't be someone who's, who's taking away from what God is doing in a room. Amen. I can feel it sometimes. Yeah. not saying I'm feeling it, but I, I, I'm in a room and I can feel the person just resisting what God is doing. Numbers 13, defining moment in Scripture. Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Cana that I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribes of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. I want you to cast verse 2. It's really, really important to, to learn how God thinks. I believe one of the ways that you should approach scripture is you're getting an insight into how God thinks and how he wants you to think. In verse 2, he says, send the men to spy out the land of Cana, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. So notice that in God's mind, he has already given them this land. In God's mind, there are things that he has set aside for you already. Psalm 139, one of my favorite thousand verses in scripture, is my thoughts, to, I say thousand because like... <laughs> We're on, the, on the way to marriage, somebody asked, what's your favorite verse? I said, that's, that's not a, it's not a kind question. <laughs> Changes every morning, depending on what really ministered to me. So, I, so my favorite thousand verse in scripture. Psalm 139 says, my thoughts towards you are like the sand of the seashore. There are many people who never explore or even, or even know it's possible to explore all those thoughts that God has for them. There are things set aside for you. 
There are things he wants to speak to you that he knew before the foundation of the world. There are things he wants to speak to you in relation to your assignment on the earth that's supposed to make the world better. Why? Because he's made you responsible for the earth. You'll notice, too, here, well, let's just back up for a moment. Part of the reason he's giving them this land, and what's part of the reason he makes covenant with them? He says, I'm, basically, when he makes covenant with this Abram, later Abraham, nation of Israel, he's still got covenant with them. The, the whole point of that is this. He wants to be a blessing to the nations of the earth. That when they see the God of Israel, when they see him operating in every area of life, they go, there's a God. And who is their God? He wants the restoration of the earth. So part of the reason you have to, God wants you to track with him and to live in your purpose is the world is supposed to be a better place because you're living properly inside of God. You know, what's, what's a common question? It's, I think actually it's a pretty good, I've heard some preachers mock it, but I think it's a good question. How can you prove the existence of God? I think it's a good question an unbeliever asks. Do you know what was to prove the existence of God? Men and women in right relationship with God were supposed to prove the existence of God. Read the Bible, Genesis 1. Adam, who was he supposed to be? God's representative. When you saw Adam, you were supposed to see what God looked like in the earth. Adam was made in the image of God, who is Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. When you saw Jesus, you saw what God looked like. Don't diminish your responsibility for the earth. So he says he's given it to him. And then he tells him to spy, it, spy out the land. So it's interesting. You'll see the, the, the co-laboring role. They still have a responsibility in bringing it to pass. And the other thing I want to suggest to you is he knew what they would see when they went to spy out the land. Right. He was okay with them seeing challenges because he had already given them an answer. Verse 21, so they went out and spied the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as near of Hanaf, and they went through the south and came to Hebron, Amishan, Shesh, Talba, and the descendants of Anak was there. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zion, Zion in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshol. There they cut down a branch with one cluster and they carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and, and figs and the place was called the valley of Eshol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down and they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. And they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron, all the congregation of Israel in the wilderness of Parnon and Kadesh, and they brought back word to them and all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told them, they said, we went to the land where you sent us and truly it flows with milk and honey and this is its fruit. The part of the reason they're saying that is because God told them that's what would be in the land. So it's very interesting that God gives them confirmation. This is what you're gonna find in the land. This is what's in the land. So they go, yeah, what God said is true, but here it is. This is their challenge. 